Once again, happy Sabbath, everyone. Thank the Lord for this morning and how wonderful God truly is. Has he been good to you? If he has not been good to you, hang around just a little while. You just don't know he's been good to you. Because if you are still breathing, he is still God. Amen? Let us look at something today. We were talking about Wednesday, our uh, last Bible study that we had, that God always wanted to dwell with us. That was the whole reason for our existence, so God could be with us. But we want to look at what that really means today. We want to look at why things are like they are as it relates to the relationship we have with our God. So please turn to the book of Exodus chapter 25 this morning. Exodus 25 this morning. God always puts things in our mind that we'll be able to understand him even more. And this is one reason we are here today. God put a Sabbath day, didn't he? He put a day that he didn't sanctify any other day. He put a day in this week so we could come and visit and, and, and study and, and, and be with him today. And we thank him for that. So we're going to look at what his word says this morning. So we may try to understand a little more clearly what God is trying to get us to be before he comes back to receive us. Exodus chapter 25. Bear with us this morning. We're going to start at verse 1. And of course, this is during the time that Israel was beginning their, their, their journey in the wilderness. Amen? They had been set free. They had been through Nelson the Passover. They had gone from Egypt. Now they're out. Amen? But we had been in Egypt so long, we had forgotten God. So God says, let me put something in place for you. And he started to, 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 to talk to, uh, to, to Moses, and he said, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it how? Willingly, with what? His heart ye shall take my offering. First of all, he said, I'm about to set something up that's going to help you. It's going to help you understand who I am and what relationship I want to have with you and the great sacrifice that it costs for you to be here this day. He said, but I need you to do something for me. He said, Tell them to bring me an offering. But he qualified that offering. He said, I don't want just any offering. I want an offering from the heart. I want a willing offering from you. Amen? Because he can't build this with unsanctified gifts. He can't build this with selfishness tainted on what you are giving. Amen? We understand that? And verse 3 says, And this is the offering which he shall take of them. Now, this is also very interesting. There's so much in this, but we're not going to try to, Sister Shaw, teach the whole Bible this morning. But there's so much in this. He said, first of all, I need a willing offering. Amen? Then he said, I'm going to tell you what I need. So sometimes we want to bring an offering to God that he didn't ask for. We want to bring our own selfish uh, derived offering to God. And God says, I didn't ask for that. But he said, I want to tell them, here's a specific offering I need for you because God knows what was going to come of it. Amen. Now he said, um, and this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and of sweet incense onyx stones, and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplates. Now, he said, I need all of this, and you all have it, because I gave it to you. When they came out of Egypt, what did they do? God favored them, didn't they? And, and they spoiled the Egyptians. They had all of these things. And he said, I need you to give them to me from a willing heart. And when you do this, then uh, uh, don't try to figure out why I'm asking for this because I've already told my servant I have a plan. So when God comes and tells you what to bring, stop trying to figure out why. Amen? When he tries to tell you, I need your service in this, stop trying to ask why. Just say, yes, Lord, teach me how to serve. So, but verse 8 was the reason for it. He said, and let them make me a sanctuary. For what purpose? That I may dwell among them. 
according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and after the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. He was talking to Moses. He said, tell the people there, but Moses, I showed you something. When you were with me on a, another level, I, I, I let you see something in the heavens, and I want you to duplicate that here on earth because I want to teach my people a way that I may dwell with them. See, it wasn't always necessary to have an earthly sanctuary, but there was a breach in the covenant. Amen? There was a breach because when Adam used to walk in the cool of the day with the Lord, they didn't need a sanctuary here on earth. Why? Because they knew how to dwell with God. But they had been Egyptians so long, we had to have these basically A, B, C blocks back to the, uh, 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 the, the, the dwelling place of God. We had forgotten we had gotten all the information from the Egyptians on how to serve their gods, and we started to do those same practices as it related to Jehovah. Bad move. God says, I can't dwell in that house. I can't, I can't be found where you don't serve me. I can't, you, 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 you took these heathen practices and you put them in my house. I can't dwell there. And he was trying to straighten out us. I mean, I'm sorry, the Israelites when they were walking through the, through the garden, amen? I mean, through the wilderness. He needed, we needed a way to understand this relationship with God so God could be with us. Remember, he said, I want to dwell with you. I want, but you can't dwell with God when you're in opposition to him. When you're serving the enemy, you can't dwell with him. Amen? amen? Now go to Genesis 1. We need to understand something about God. This is why God is God and we are not God. And we should say yea and amen to what God says. Genesis chapter 1. God loves us. He loved us back then. He loves us now. In Genesis chapter 1, it's verse 26. Genesis 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make who? Man. Man. So who made us? So we didn't make ourselves. Amen. So our ideas really don't matter. What about our traditions? What about our doctrine? What about our lack of understanding concerning the way to worship God? It means nothing outside of God. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. You mean my dog doesn't have dominion over my house? Don't tell that to some people. Do you mean the earth doesn't have dominion over man? You're scared of that one, aren't you? The environmentalists are going to hang you from a tree. My God gave me dominion over this, but he also gave us responsibility to take care of it. Amen? But don't let somebody say Mother Gaia is stronger than God. Mother Gaia is Mother Earth, okay? You'll be hearing about this in your new religion that's coming. They're going to say, bow down and worship the earth. Bow down and give homage to the trees. You've seen movies, haven't you? Haven't you seen the movie Avatar? I don't see. I, I don't go to movies. Yes, you do. It was all about the environment and how the environment was going to save man. We have to understand, God says, man, I have given you dominion but I've given you responsibility. No, you can't just dog nature. <laughs> you can't just use up these things. You have to be responsible, but don't ever let anybody tell you that the earth is not yours. Amen? Let's keep reading. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. And replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be what? Man and woman at this point were in a perfect state. They were perfect. Would you agree? Sin had not entered in at, as of this time. They were in a perfect state, but they had rules. Did they not? They had to follow the instruction of their creator. Do we believe that? 
even in their perfect state. They had instructions from God. Why? Because God loves them. And he loves us. Can you imagine in our sinful straight, straight state how much instruction we need from God? But what do people say? I don't want to be told what to do. I don't want to follow any kind of order. I want to be who I want to be. I want to serve like I want to serve. I want to worship the way I want to worship. That's why you got that from the Egyptians. And they wouldn't let you do it. That's why you're not in their church today. Amen? <laughs> Oh, y'all forgot I, I was gone last week, so I got a lot of energy. Genesis chapter 2. I know you missed me. You said, oh, Lord, my feet hurt already. We're just five minutes into the sermon. Genesis chapter 2. God says, I gave you some instructions because I love you. That's how you dwell with me. You got to follow the instructions of the creator so the creator can dwell with you. And I know you and I agree on this. We need God dwelling with us and in us. Amen? Genesis 2. Let's go to 16, if you would. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. Why? For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Adam should have said, Thank you, Lord. I could have messed up and eaten from that tree. <laughs> But what happened? Someone took the instruction as a hindrance. Somebody caught the spirit of Satan and decided that God's instructions were hindering me from being who I am. You ever heard that before? You're trying to keep me from being who I am. And the spirit of Lucifer was in that. We have to understand that instructions are not hindrance, but they're more of a guardrail. Why? Because God knows what's on the other side of your disobedience. And because he loves you so much, he doesn't want you to have to experience that. Please understand that's what the instruction of God are. It's not a hindrance. It's a protecting element that he gives us. So we won't have to go through what we go through. But we take, what do we take? We say, God, you're trying to hinder me. That's what Lucifer said in heaven. Why can't I be like God? Remember Isaiah chapter 14? He said, I'll be like the most high. God is a, is a terrible God. As, as, as you was experiencing uh, uh, last night, he said God is a hateful God. He's a selfish God. That is the spirit of Satan himself. But we have to understand God is so loving. He says, look, man, don't go left. There's a bear over there. And we complain even as the bear starts to eat us. Because we'll say, why didn't God stop the bear? God told you there was a bear over there. Don't go over there. And we kept trying to go. And he kept trying to put a fence up. And he tried to put barbed wire up. And you kept trying to go over there with the bear. And then when the bear gets you, what's the first thing out of your mouth? Why does God allow this to happen? Is that not true? I'm not talking about y'all. Y'all good Christian folk, right? But please understand, God wants to dwell with us. And so in order for us, we have to be in line with the Creator for him to dwell fully in us. We can't be at opposition of God and ask him to be with us. It doesn't work like that. Anybody been in a, well, some people have been in a marriage like that. The husband is in opposition with the wife and the wife is in opposition with the husband. What kind of marriage is that? It doesn't work, does it? Go to Exodus 13. We got to see this this morning. God really has given us these things so we can dwell with him and he can dwell in us. David said, I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Because he said, that's all I want to do. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. He, he just knew he wanted God to dwell with him. And whatever he had to do to line up with God, he did it. Did David have a few hiccups along the way? Yes. But his goal was to dwell with God and have God dwell with him. And he understood that there were some instructions that we had to deal with in order to keep us where we needed to be. Verse chapter 19 of Exodus. Let's go to verse 3. And it says, And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, don't you need someone to talk to God? 
See, if no one is talking to God, we got a problem, don't we? Because if Israel doesn't have someone talking to God, Israel is going to be Egyptian. So let us understand that God always has a servant. Thus shall thou say unto the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Why? Because I want to dwell with you. You couldn't hear me in Egypt. You couldn't even imagine what I wanted when you were in Egypt. Why is that? Because Egypt had all other gods. If you look at spiritual Egypt, you'll understand that in Egypt was everything in opposition to Christ. Matter of fact, the Bible talks about that Christ was crucified in Egypt. He was talking spiritually, correct? Because Egypt is everything that's anti-God. So if we are practicing Egyptian religion, are we dwelling with God? No. Do you know how much Egypt we have in us? Especially the, uh, the, uh, what we call, people call the African-American community. We love Egyptian culture. Why? Because they say what? That's our roots. I want to go past Egypt. I want to go back to the garden. That's my roots. And I want to walk with the God of the garden, not the God of Ra. I don't want to go Horace. I don't want to be worshiping beetles. I don't want to have these things on my body and in my mind to keep me from knowing and dwelling with God. I know Egypt is that because he told me that. Why can't we serve God like we want to serve God? Because we haven't walked away from Egypt yet. But God said in verse 4, you saw what I did to the Egyptians. Who won that battle? God did, right? So when you want to be winner, winner, he, he kind of stepped on the Egyptians. <laughs> he kind of said, my people are crazy, but I'm going to get them. Moses, go get them. And all the miracles that he performed against the mighty Egypt. Then why we want to be Egyptians? Then he took us out of Egypt. And Egypt came and looking and trying to try to get us. And God says, let me perform another miracle against Egypt. He, he really wanted the people to understand I want to dwell with you, and I have the power to make that happen. Verse 5 says, Now therefore, he said, I brought you out of Egypt, and I brought you unto myself. And verse 5 says, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice, indeed. So what does God require? Obedience. Are we okay with that? Are we okay that God has some instructions that we need to obey? Because that's a big point. If you don't believe that, then you're going to have a problem with God of the heavens dwelling with you. He said, look, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is whose? Mine. mine. Not the environmentalist. All the earth is mine. Now, he said, I want you to be, you, be this peculiar people. Amen? He said, don't you want to be the peculiar people? The peculiar people are the people that God dwells with. He said, look, if you keep my covenant, then you shall be this people. Verse 6 says, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. It's time for us to understand we are to be a holy nation. We are to be this nation that follows God in all things, and we are to be a nation of obedient servants and children of God. When we want to rebel against him, he can't dwell with us. Maybe you think you're better than the devil. Anybody have a, a tussle with him once in a while? Adam did, and he was perfect. Eve did, and she was perfect. And what happened to her? Loss. They lost. So you can step out there outside the instructions of the Most High and see how well you do. Let me tell you from experience, it's not a pretty picture. I know God, but you remember those conversations you used to have with God? Used to, right? You don't have those anymore because you do exactly what God asked you to do. God, I want to do this because that's just what I feel like doing. And you get slapped in the head and you want to blame God for the slap. You get out there on Satan's enchanted ground and want to know why I'm under a spell. And God says, I ask you just to stay under the blood. That's all I ask you to do. You only think about Passover. Remember how you put the blood over the, 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 the doorpost and around the top? 
And in, in Exodus, I believe it's chapter 12, what, what he talked about, he said, stay in the house. Meaning, stay under the blood. Right. Amen? Amen? He said, look now, I'm coming to destroy. Stay under the blood. When we step out, we're in and out of the blood, aren't we? The destroyed angel is coming. It's already here. It's destroying everything. He said, but if you stay under the blood, I can dwell with you. I can protect you. Stop coming in and out of the blood. But we do that. The question today is, what about us? Are we like the children of Israel? Who said, no, I, I want to be a, a, na a peculiar nation, but I don't want to follow the instruction. So I really don't want you dwelling with me, Lord. The book of Isaiah talks about seven women and one man. And what those seven women said were, we will eat our own bread. We will wear our own apparel. Just let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. That's the modern Christianity approach to the relationship with God. Look, we're not going to do what you say. We're not going to follow your instruction. We want to be called by your name because we know that without you, we lost. That's not how we do things, is it? We're not going to live like that, are we? Somebody has got to stand for the truth, and the truth said God has instructions in righteousness that we must follow. 1 John chapter 2. What about us this morning? What about us? Are we Egyptian Christians? Are we a peculiar people Christian? 1 John chapter 2. I promise you one day you all will have a happy sermon. And that you all will be able to smile and say amen. And look, and, and, and this is one of them. You just ain't figured that out yet. Because see, you're standing on the edge of the boat. And you're about to fall off. And anytime somebody can come and say, oh, here's the way, walk therein. Don't fall off the boat. That's a happy sermon. Amen. Well, I can, we, can, we can stay up here and preach to you. Oh, <laughs> God's a blessing God. And your, and your season is coming. <laughs> Praise him. And everybody, whew, that was just a good sermon. Whew, I'm, I'm so uplifted, I'm happy. This should be uplifting because God is trying to talk to you. I thought it was very pleasant as he gave it to me. I said, thank you, God. I said, you didn't have to let us know that we have to do this this way. And what's wonderful about it, he said, I'll put my spirit in you so you can. Amen. So you won't be in error. So you won't get to the to pearly gates and say, Lord, but didn't I serve you? He said, man, get away from me, you workers of iniquity. I'm so glad he, he, he stopped us. And you ought to be rejoicing that God stopped you. Where were you last year? Where were you 10 years ago? Some of you weren't even here 20 years ago. <laughs> but just imagine this. God chose you to listen to his voice. Can't you be happy? Can't we be happy about that? Okay. Sister Jerry, you and I will be happy for everybody. <laughs> First John chapter 2. Let's look at this. God said in verse 3 of 1 John 2, he said, and hereby we do know that we know him. This is good to know, isn't it? If you want to dwell with God, isn't it good to know how you can determine if you're dwelling with God and you know God? He said, hereby we do know that we know him, if what? Are we okay with that? Amen. See, that, that, that's in the New Testament. Okay? That's not the old Jewish law. That's in the New Commandment. That's in the New or the Second Testament. He said, we know that we know him, because we keep his commandments. Do you see the connection in obedience and a dwelling of God? Verse 4. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, uh -uh, is a what? Who said that? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Amen? So Jesus, the Holy Ghost, told this man to write this thing down, and he said, you're a liar if you don't obey. And what's funny about it, I remember my grandmother saying this, and the truth ain't in you. <laughs> nowhere. Ain't nowhere in you at all. Let's keep going. 
verse 5 says, But whosoever keepeth his word, amen, in him verily is the love of God, what? Perfected. God loves us. That never changes, but it becomes perfected when we start loving him. Then you have a two-way street going on. In love better when both parties are in love. Oh, you want to be in one of them one-way relationships. That's called a fantasy. I'm, I'm in love, and I just, no, and the other party has no idea what you're talking about. God says, I want you to love me because I really love you. And he wants this love perfected when we start understanding and keeping his word. He said, hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought, ought, ought himself also to what? So to walk even as he walked. You claim in Jesus, amen? That's what you're here for. That's what you say, Jesus is your savior. You're claiming him, are you walking him? A man said down in Louisiana, it doesn't matter what you do. It just matters what you believe. The most demonic statement I've heard in a month. What you believe makes you do. Whatever that belief is, you are doing what you believe. You don't do what you don't believe. If you didn't believe that chair would hold you, would you sit down? <laughs> no, nah, no, nah, I'm going to stand up. <clears throat> but God said, he that saith he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. So if Christ is abiding in us, we are going to be walking as Christ walked. Christ was obedient to who? His father all the time. Let's keep reading verse 7. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye have from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard. When? So from the beginning, God had a word of instruction. How could Adam sin if there was no commandment? If there was no law, how could they be sinned? Because sin is the transgression of the law. And so the law was before the foundation of the earth. Isn't that wonderful to know that you don't have to worry that it's Jewish? Man, I couldn't have my whole belief in a God that was limited to a nationality. Because them guys might go crazy. Or even that, if I had my belief in God determined by denomination. They might go crazy. They might change and say, what? There's no resurrection. I heard that this morning for brother. I said, I, I can't believe they are just. I can't believe they're saying it. I just can't believe anybody listening. We know it was a resurrection, right? How do we know that? It's in the word. Please hang on to it. Hang on to the word. Hang on to the word. Hang on to the word. Proverbs chapter 1. We're not going to keep you long today. Well, I'll put it like this. I wouldn't, but God might have a few things more he wants to talk to you about. Proverbs chapter 1. Oh, Lord says, look, I've given you instructions because I love you. And when you follow me and I abide in you, you walk just like me. And we, and we become the image that we were in the beginning. Don't we want to be that? God says, I cre let's, let's make man in our own image. Let's give him our character. Let's give him our ability to, to, to love. Let's give him all these things. And that's how it was in the beginning. And what he's saying here, he says, look, man, we could get back to that if you let me abide in you. But sometimes we don't listen. Proverbs chapter 1. He was talking and saying, look, man, here's a difference between those who do and those who don't. And, and, and it's a horrible existence when we don't. Proverbs chapter 1. Let's go to verse 23. We begin there today. He said, turn ye at my reproof. So if God, what's reproof? Hmm? Correction? Enlightenment? <laughs> Instruction? God said, turn you at my reproof. God says, when I tell you something, I'm telling you because you're going the wrong way. Turn. Amen? Yeah. 
Are we okay with God telling us to turn? Do you okay that God can identify that you are going in the wrong direction? Do we trust him? He said, turn at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. That is such a wonderful statement. I don't have to be smart. He said, I will do this if you turn at my reproof. See, that's what God is looking for, those who will, will, will turn. Because we're all going in the wrong direction. Some of us aren't going in, in certain avenues that we used to go down. Amen? You know, some of us aren't, aren't getting high before we come to church like we used to. Amen? Oh, look at you. <laughs> um, I, I believe in disclosing what I know about all of you. Not because I'm smart. Not because I'm an old wise sage. It's because my God tells me. Why? To serve you better. That's all. The only reason I get information is so I can serve you. We want that job. Can't use information but for one thing, to serve you. And that's what we do. And that's what God asks us. He said, that's why I stand there and tell them this. He said, I want you to know something. I'll pour my spirit out if you turn. Verse 24 is a problem. Here is where most of us have to suffer. He said, because I have called, and you what? You refuse what? To turn in his reproof. Therefore, you didn't get his spirit, because those who get his spirit have already, what? Turned in his reproof, who have already admitted that they're not God, who already decided that God knows more than me, and I think I'm going to try what he says. He said, because I have called, and ye refuse. I have stretched out my hand and no man regardeth. Did that sound like an evil God, a selfish God, a mean God who's not trying to get you to the promised land? It sounds like somebody trying to give you every opportunity that he can give you, but he can't force you. And that's what's so wonderful about God. God said, I ain't going to force you to do this. I want you to love you into doing this. And his love is so overwhelming. Sometimes you can't even imagine it. He keeps stretching out his hand to us, and we keep knocking it away. When he tells you something and you say, no, I, I want to believe this way. No, no. He says, stop. Please turn. Please turn. But let's keep reading about those other people, amen, who, who, who said it not my counsel and, and, and with none of my reproof. Verse 26 says, I also will laugh at your calamity. Anybody in this room want that to be the case? I will laugh at your calamity. Why? Because you didn't turn at my reproof. You would not accept the unction of the Holy Spirit at time after time after time. He didn't do it the first time you didn't turn. Y'all know that, don't you? He didn't do it the first time. I don't know if he didn't do it the thousandth time. But there's a point that God says, okay, we're going to let this calamity try to get you into understanding some things. Because this calamity is going to happen, and I'm going to laugh. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as des desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me. But what will happen? Ooh. I will not answer. You want to be in that circumstance? God won't answer. Who? I don't know. He makes that decision. I don't know how he comes to that decision or when that decision happens, but he said there'll come a time I won't answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge. How do you hate knowledge? You refuse to turn in his reproof. <coughs> he tries to give you this. He tries to give me this. And I say, no, Lord. I got another way. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my repute. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them. He calls you simple. Yeah, anybody ever want to be called a simple-minded person? But he calls us simple when we decide that we're not going to turn at his reproof. 
Then he says, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But oh, here's verse 33. But whosoever hearkeneth unto me shall what? Dwell safely and shall be quiet, what? From fear of evil. There's a time you're living in now that evil is all around and you are afraid. Why? Because we haven't quite connected with our God. We're going to need this connection. We're going to need him dwelling with us because he said, if you hearken to me, you'll dwell safely. Who said that? Okay, I'm going to read it again out of the same book that you have on your app or in your hand. He says, but whosoever hearkeneth unto me shall dwell how? Safely. Who said that? The Lord did. The same Lord that said, let there be light. The same Lord that said, look, uh, uh, zinc, copper, uh, uh, all these minerals that are in the dirt be in your body. The same Lord that said, let the sun rise in the east and set in the west. Let me ask you, did the sun rise in the east this morning? So the word of God is true. And as surely as that sun rose in the east, you will dwell how? Safely. If you turn in his reproof. Isn't that comforting? Because you'll be quiet. From fear of evil. What you say out of your mouth, it won't be fear. In the midst of the hurricane, you'll be singing hymns. You know, they did that back in the days when they were martyring Christians. Oh, they were singing hymns when they were dropping them in the oil. And they were, they were sitting there and, and they were crucifying them and they were saying, praise God. Every drop of Christian blood sprouted up five different Christians. He said, but they, they didn't fear evil. They didn't say evil didn't exist. They just didn't fear it. They didn't have to have a conversation about it. I'm not giving the devil credit. You know the devil busy. So I'm not giving him credit over my God. My God is God. Amen? Amen. Pharaoh even had to say that. Nicodemus, Nick, Nick, Nebuchadnezzar said it. Oh, we know he went down to get, get Daniel. He said... Daniel, your God, who you serve continually, is he able? Yeah. And then when David said, uh, live, oh, what he said, live, oh, king, live forever. <laughs> Two people were very happy, David and the king. And what happened? He proved that God was God. So don't let the devil get the victory over you by you keep speaking fear. You keep speaking, oh, he's busy. You keep speaking, the devil's doing this. Man, the devil has nothing against you if you are dwelling safely with God. Amen. Ask Job. Devil knew the deal. When the covenant was made, I can't touch Job because Job is dwelling with you. Can I get permission? <laughs> he said, yeah, I'm going to show you something, Satan. You think by hurting my servant that my servant will curse me. I'm going to show you, and I'm going to show those for thousands of years that he dwelled with me, and he didn't curse me. Matter of fact, he said, naked, I came into this world. Naked, I leave. Hey, blessed be the name of the Lord. And it crushed the kingdom of Satan. Because you're talking about it today. You see how powerful a testimony of staying and dwelling with God can be? Thousands of years later, we're still talking about it. We're going to be all right. Go to 1 John 3. We're going to find out how well we're going to be. <laughs> and we're going to start now. We don't have to wait until the resurrection that they say don't exist to be with God. We're going to dwell with God now. Because God says, I got a promise for my people. For those who will turn at my reproof and allow the Holy Spirit to come within them. I have a promise for them. 1 John chapter 3. And we got to believe this. I don't want you to get bent out of shape about small things. God is a big God. Don't hang your salvation on foolishness. Accept the Lord God of Israel. Accept Jesus as your Savior. And I don't mean just with your words, with your life. If Jesus said, look, I need everybody to wear blue shoes, 
how would I know that you were with Jesus? If you had some blue shoes on. I got some people over here with orange shoes saying they're walking with Jesus. But I, what would happen? No, those can't be because the obedient ones are wearing blue shoes. Now, let me tell you, he didn't say it, okay? Some of us come from, from, from backgrounds that you have to do this. You know? No. Just follow Jesus. Study Jesus. Let the Holy Spirit come and instruct you in righteousness. Because here's a promise from God. 1 John chapter 3. Amen. 1 John chapter 3. We'll start at verse 22. And whatsoever we, what? Look at this. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of who? Him. Because we keep his commandments. I mean, you just can't ask God for anything and live the way you want to live. God, I need Cadillac. So I go to the casino. What? What? what, what? God, I, 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 need, I need a better job. So, so I can, uh, 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 you know, uh, keep my gambling habit going or I need a better job so I can, I can build better, my bigger place. I want to I wanna find this. I want I want an uh, $8,000 television. I need a better job. God said, hold on. Stop. I gave you the whole earth. How big your TV need to be? He said, look here. What I need you to do is keep my commandments. And by keeping his commandments, the Spirit of God is in you. Therefore, who is asking God for something? Uh, okay, I know that was, that's a geometric formula. This postulate is just too much. Okay, listen. When you're lining up with God, that's why you can ask. Because you're only asking for godly things and for godly reasons. Can you have a new car? Yes. But God said, I'm not an anti-stuff the earth is mine. I want my servants to be happy. I want my servants to love me so much that they don't mind asking. He said, but look, this is what I want. Because you keep my commandments and do those things that are pleasing in my sight. That's why whatever you ask for. You ever been struggling with something? And you ask, Lord, I've been asking you for four years and you haven't. Okay, let's make it. Three days. That's, that's about our attention span. Lord, you haven't, Lord heard you. He did. Sometimes he says, if you want me to give it to you, it's going to be this. It might take 20 years, but you ask me to give it to you. Yeah, I didn't, you didn't ask the devil. The devil will do that. And you'll be dead tomorrow. God says, you want me to do it? Because that's what he said. He said, receive of him. He said, let me do it then. Let me do it the way I know to do it. Because when I, when I come with it, that blessing has a train behind it. Blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing. But no, I want this little stanky little blessing I ask you for. And I want it now. He said, man, I got many carts on that train. And I want to give it to my servant those who keep my commandments, who turn in my reproof, who obey my voice. I want you all to be the most successful ever live on this earth. Do you believe that? He said, and my success is different than the world's success. If it takes 200 million, it, here. You know people out there got that kind of money. And we'll give it to you. Why? Because they are following the commandments of God. Or, or they say, maybe one time in their life, they hear the Holy Spirit say, write this. See, we got to understand who he is and who we are to him. He said, I want to dwell with you. And this is why. I want to save you, and I want to use you to save others. But you got to be able to be molded in my hand. And the only way to do that is to follow my instruction. Let's keep reading. Verse 23 says, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, who? Jesus Christ. And do what? And love, oh, that's too much. And love one another. As he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And here, hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given. 
That's why people say, I, I, I don't understand the Bible. What, wait, what are they? Here's the question. How do we know if God dwells with us? Bang, there's the answer. How do we know if we're doing what God says? Bang, there's the answer. Amen? <coughs> so we're at a point in our Christian walk that we can say, Father, help me turn at your reproof. Don't let me kick against the pricks. Are we at that point yet? Can we say, Father, I realize something. I don't know anything. But I know you. And you asked me to believe in you. And I'm going to believe and I'm going to show I believe by my faith in you will make me work. Will make me walk as Christ walked. He said, I'll show you my faith by my works. And the first thing we have to do is be willing to turn. It's okay. Nobody's embarrassed. Amen. None of you have done anything so heinous that you would be embarrassed to tell God. Guess who was there? Who saved you from your embarrassment? Who saved you from that time you had your head in a public toilet? Lord, if you get me out of this, I won't drink anymore. <laughs> But I know, young people, y'all good Christians, y'all ain't never done that. Talk to old heads. <laughs> but God said, I've been calling you a long time. Now hear me. You got to really understand why you are here. He's been calling you. Some of us have listened a little bit, haven't we? Some of us has been chosen. It didn't happen overnight but we don't want to misrepresent God by claiming his name in vain. You know, we take the name of the Lord in vain when we decide we're not hearing his reproof. We decide, well, that commandment, yeah, but I'm going to excuse those commandments out of my life because I see them as restrictions instead of guardrails. I'm going to compromise myself in saying, well, Lord, since I don't believe that it is not true, there are some people who believe the truth is relative. Do you know if there's no absolutes, we're in trouble? <laughs> Amen. Gravity is an absolute. Anybody have trouble believing that? If you do, jump off a building. No, don't. Please don't. Because well, the pastor told you to go jump off the building, and I did. Well, you dumb. Don't do that. But they're absolutes, and God is an absolute. His truth is absolute, and his son Jesus is an absolute savior. And we have to follow him how? Absolutely. By his Holy Spirit. Amen? Let's have a word of prayer.